Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome everyone to our our official um, agenda of our regular meeting of the Board of Trustees for the San Angelo Independent School District. Um, my name is Max Parker. I'm the president. We have a quorum here. All our board members here except Lanny Lehman, who is out of the country. Uh, no, he's in the country, just way up in the northeast, I think, right now. Um, but uh, before we go further, I'm going to ask uh, Chris Curran, who's the pastor of Southland Baptist Church, to give us our invocation tonight. Just join me in a word of prayer. When we open up the scriptures and we read about Jesus of Nazareth, one of his titles that he is called the most is teacher. And so we just take great solace in knowing that Jesus knows what it is to be a teacher. And in this day and time, we lift up our teachers. We thank you for the calling, God, that you have put on their lives. We ask that you would grant our teachers and our administrators wisdom. We thank you for the sacrifice they make on a day in and day out basis to teach our students. We thank you for the endurance that they have given last year and now this year, and we ask that you would just continue to remind them of the great vocation that you have given them. Remind them that you identify too as a teacher. Remind them that their work each and every day is making a difference in children that will go much further than they ever know. We invite you to this place. We ask for wisdom. Amen. Thank you, sir. I think I'll go through our script um, that we read before every meeting so that uh, everyone will know the, uh, our protocol. As I said earlier, I'd like to welcome all of you who are present at our meeting tonight. I also want to welcome all that are watching the tape of this meeting through our public access channel, Channel 4. We appreciate, excuse me, we appreciate all of you and your interest you have in our students. All our items that will be discussed at our meeting tonight except one have been, well, all our items have been posted as required by state law. And as all of you may be aware, our board meets a minimum of two times a month. And most, if not all, of our items on our agenda this evening have been previously discussed at our earlier pre-agenda board workshop, which was last, last Monday. As member of the SAISD Board of Trustees, we're here to set goals, listen to reports from our superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and to make policy for the district. Please keep in mind that our meeting is a meeting of the Board of Trustees held in public and not a meeting of the public. However, with that in mind, we do have an item on every one of our meeting agendas that allows anyone present who wishes to speak to our board team an opportunity to do so. You need to be sure that you sign in at this back table if you would like to uh, speak to us. I will make certain that we give everyone an opportunity to speak on any item not listed on our agenda, and we have that on uh, uh, tonight. We'll be ready for that. Additionally, prior to taking any votes on any agenda item, I will ask audience members if they would like to make any comments. Anyone wishing to make comments on an agenda item should do their best to limit their comments to three to five minutes. Also, if, you're, if there's several making comments and you uh, agree with someone else, you may just want to say, you know, I'm here and I, I agree with Mr. Jones and what he said or whatever, um, and you don't have to repeat everything if it's, if it's almost identical comments. In compliance with state law, these proceedings are recorded and will become a part of SAISD's permanent legal record. In order that the tape will adequately reflect the proceedings, I ask that you please refrain from talking while others are speaking. I also ask, as I remind my fellow board members, please turn off or silence your cell phones. Again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's meeting. Thank you for taking time to join us this evening. We appreciate your interest in the activities of our students and the business of our district. All right. Now we've got four students here tonight from Lamar Elementary. I want to introduce them. There's Mason Calvary. Come up, Mason. Sophia Stinnett. Come up, Sophia. Uh, Sutton Young and Hadley Young. 
And would everyone please stand as they lead us in our pledge to allegiance to the United States flags and also to the Texas flag. Come back up, students, because some are going to take photos, okay? <laughs> and parents, you can come up closer if you want to. Thank you again, guys. At this time, I'm going to turn things over for recognitions to Whitney Wood and Molly Turk. Good evening, Mr. Parker and distinguished members of the board. Tonight, we have an honorable recognition of a group that has been a blessing and supporting to our San Angelo ISD students and schools for nearly two decades. Our friends at DESK, which many of you know is short for Donate Educational Supplies for Kids. These incredible supporters of public education with us tonight dedicate their time, energy, and talents to raise funds for our SAISD students who are in need of school supplies. School supplies to learn, grow, create, and think critically. To provide a little background for those who are unfamiliar with DESK, in 2004, the founder and board president, Eric Wilson, identified an unmet need in our community and set his focus, determination, and generous spirit on finding a solution. That solution was the formation of a board of concerned Concho Valley community members who set out to raise funds for SAISD students in need of school supplies. Since 2004, Desk, Desk has raised an astounding $851,815.80 and brought countless smiles to our students, ultimately helping them to succeed in the classroom and beyond. This year, Desk has generously given school supply funds in a total amount of $71,260.71. That's over $70,000 that is allocated and then distributed out to all of our campuses helping individual children have the supplies they need to be confident and to be on a path to succeed. And importantly, covering a need that otherwise many teachers would feel compelled to do as well. So really helping our teachers too. Each campus in the district receives a percentage of the total amount of the money raised. I also wanna provide you a closer glimpse of what this looks like in our schools, many of which are composed of a majority of under-resourced families. In speaking with one of our principals, she told me a few stories, and this is just a few of many. Desk supports new foster families working to prepare three foster children for their first day of school after being pulled from difficult circumstances and put into a new home just days before. Desk supports a single mother working hard, in SASD is one of our cafeteria workers, to make sure her child has all he needs. Desk supports a sweet child who I have personally met who lost her mother two years ago to feel loved and cared for with the gift of needed school supplies. There are just, these are just three stories of many, but what an impact. Please join me in recognizing these members of the desk board with us tonight and thank them for joining with SAISD and supporting the hopes and dreams of our students. Dr. Dr. Dethloff, at this time, would you please come forward and help me recognize the desk board members who are here this evening Desk board members, when we call your name, please come forward, and Dr. Dethloff will present, or actually Molly Johnson-Turk will present your certificate. We would like for you to stay for a group photo after that. Eric Wilson. Sorry, I saw they saw him. <laughs> Diane Wilson. Vicki Loso. Cheryl Book. Ken Grimm. Andy Meyer. 
and I don't know if she made it here yet, Jacqueline Ochoa. Oh, there she is. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all so much. Mr. Park, I'm not sure that, that uh, they actually mentioned the exact figure, but uh, DES this year raised over $71,000 for school supplies for kids here in San Angelo. So, again, thank you to that board. Well, it was mentioned, they, <clears throat> it's becoming an annual thing that they're always uh, very supportive of our district, and uh, we really appreciate them. And I'm sorry they've already left before I could uh, get that on the record, but it's uh, all good people, we get to shake their hands, and it's usually the same ones each year. So I appreciate them volunteering their time for this. All right, Dr. Gomez. Mr. Parker, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board, we are thrilled this evening to recognize Sylvia Graves again. So Sylvia, if you could come on up. And just to recall for all our board members, our audience members, and those watching um, through television. Along this wall on the boardroom, you'll see the individual pictures of our 2021 Teachers of the Year. Well, Sylvia, she might feel a little awkward with this larger picture right here, but you'll notice uh, Mrs. Graves and Lena Rivera over here, their pictures are larger because they were our overall winners for the elementary and secondary level, and Celia was our secondary representative. We're here this evening to recognize Mrs. Graves for being the Region 15 Secondary Teacher of the Year. So that means out of all of our area schools, Mrs. Graves will be going forward to recognize San Angelo ISD for Region 15 for being the Secondary Teacher of the Year. So congratulations to Mrs. Graves. Just a few things um, to, if individuals were not aware, we are pleased to have Mrs. Graves serving in San Angelo ISD for 13 years as of last year. I hope we have the years correct still. She, we all, we're double checking ourselves here. Mrs. Graves currently serves in our 18 plus vocational a program through our special education department. And she has the great privilege of working with adult students every day to help them be productive citizens in our San Angelo community. Just a few words, I think it's very powerful to hear from Mrs. Graves' peers and a few words for how they themselves categorize Mrs. Graves and her high levels of professionalism. They said she is a masterful relationship builder. Sylvia approaches each challenge with joy and optimism. She spends each day working with adult students who have significant disabilities by challenging them, engaging them with respect, validating their emotions, and inspiring them to reach for their excellence. So again, let's congratulate Mrs. Graves, our Region 15 Secondary Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. <laughs> Dr. Detloff, will you come up one more time? Mrs. Graves. And while Dr. Dr. Detloff is coming forward, I just want the audience to know that when um, Dr. Gomez said she's the secondary teacher of the year for the whole region, that is 44 school districts. Uh, so this is a really high honor, and we really appreciate you, and congratulations.
Mr. Parker, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board, we are proud to congratulate and celebrate Central High School principal, Mr. Bill Waters, on being named the Texas Music Educators Association as a distinguished administrator. The award recognizes upper level school administrators across Texas who have been instrumental in preserving quality music education programs on their campuses and in their district. Mr. Waters' dedication to his students and staff is evident in his advocacy for the fine arts and his support of both our musically skilled students and staff. This is reflected in programs with consistent award-winning seasons. Most recently, our UIL Sweepstakes Awards and our TMA, TMEA All Music students. Uh, Principal Waters is a shining example of how our people make the difference and a direct reflection of the San Angelo ISD educator profile. Although Mr. Waters could not be with us this evening as he's preparing for a great uh, week of celebration for Bobcat Homecoming Week, please join me in congratulating him on this accomplishment. And now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Jason Skelton, a Director of Data Services and Student Services, to talk about an incredible team that really helped us out with registration and back to school that we really wouldn't, quite frankly, have been able to do some, all the things that we had planned to do this year without their help. Mr. Parker, Dr. Deloff, members of the board, thank you so much for letting me uh, have this time to honor our data services team. You guys want to come up for a second? Our whole team is not here, um, but the data services team, many people don't know they have a hand in everything we do from hiring to onboarding teachers to uh, rostering students to any program in any department to paychecks, everything. They touch it. They, they make this uh, thing work. Uh, one of the stories that people also don't know about is... Uh, you remember when we started Schoology, that was gonna be a two year project. We were planning on getting Schoology started and then as you know, uh, everything hit. They were able to implement Schoology, which is recommended for two years as an implementation, they did it in 21 days. 21 days, uh, this team came together and just pushed it out, made it, made it work so that we could have started school last year virtually, which is an incredible thing. Um, but not only that, they, they put out a lot of fires. And uh, we are very proud of them, but many people don't see them because they are behind the scenes in everything. And so this is Eric Combs, Leticia Hasso, we have Jeanette Shellac, and Joe Medley here. Uh, others that couldn't be here are Martin Delgado, we have um, Isaiah Marin, and we have Wayne Giddings. Did I catch everybody? And Matt Miller. So... I just wanted to say thank you guys for what you do for the district. A lot of people don't recognize that and don't see that, but they just know that their things work. We need to uh, approve our minutes um, for three meetings. 
The meetings will be August 9, 2021, our special finance pre-agenda meeting, August 16, 2021, regular board meeting, and August 30, 2021, our special meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. We have a motion by Mr. Dindle, a second by Mr. Gallegos um, to approve this agenda item. Um, is there any other board discussion? Any public comment on our uh, minutes? If not, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Motion passes. Uh, we have one agenda item that uh, we are going to discuss next that we didn't have on our pre-agenda uh, meeting last week. And so just for those in the audience, we will discuss this agenda item. Then we'll have several, uh, four or five of you have spoken to, about public comments on topics not on the agenda, most of it. Most of you say it's about the mask mandate, so we will get with you right after we discuss this particular agenda item. Uh, our board uh, had mentioned to Dr. Detloff that we had some funds, uh, ESSER funds, and we wanted to know if we could use those funds and uh, uh, to, for them to do a study on what we might be able to use those funds to help us make our schools uh, safe from uh, COVID and the variant. and. So uh, they have a proposal for us to that. And uh, so that's why we've added that to the agenda. And Jason Henry will be our uh, one of the administrators to discuss this. And part of it we're going to discuss is air quality systems or ventilation systems. And he has some guests here to uh, uh, give us more information about that. We've also asked Dr. Detloff and his staff to bring us up to date on our numbers of students who are out with COVID and what information Dr. Detloff is receiving from his meetings with the county health officials and county and city leaders. And then we also uh, will have here some from George McFarland, our assistant superintendent in charge of finance, of how we can utilize uh, the funds for the ventilation system, how we can use our ESSER funds to do that. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Detloff right now. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Uh, I just wanted to provide uh, our constituents and audience and the team here this evening uh, really a summary about our uh, current COVID protocols uh, and mitigation efforts that we're uh, utilizing as a school district. Uh, in just a moment, you'll hear from uh, Dr. Gomez, and uh, she will be highlighting some of the uh, specific details uh, around cur uh, current COVID numbers. So we are trending uh, in a positive light recently, uh, so we're excited about uh, those trend lines, and we hope, uh, certainly hope that that continues. Uh, as Mr. Parker mentioned earlier, uh, one of the items, every Monday we participate in a uh, citywide, what we call a COVID call, uh, with city and county officials, also our local health authorities, uh, and then uh, entities and systems uh, such as uh, Shannon Hospital, uh, Goodfellow Air Force Base, Angelo State University, Howard College, the school district. So we have this joint meeting every Monday uh, where we uh, look at data from across our community and across the, uh, the many systems involved in our community. Uh, recently, about maybe two or three weeks ago, we also formed a uh, joint task force. Uh, this joint task force we met once um, with uh, entities from, again, the same organizations that uh, I just mentioned. Uh, and there, the, really the, the goal, the primary goal, was to come up with a unified approach in our city and community to curtail uh, the impact of the Delta variant. So we wanted to come up with a unified approach because there is not one single entity in our, uh, in our, in our community that can stand alone in this effort. So it's going to take uh, adjustments uh, and mitigation efforts from all of our, our entities working as a unified uh, group to really curtail the impact of the Delta variant in our community. Uh, you may have seen there were some videos that were generated uh, by this COVID task force. Uh, and again, in, that, in those videos, we really just talked about um, different ways that we can take personal responsibility. So what are ways that you as an individual can take personal responsibility uh, to help our city uh, move on the upward trend of, of COVID and, and get back to doing what we do best in San Angelo. So those efforts were made uh, with that joint task force. And then um, some of the, the local um, 
school district uh, strategies that we've utilized. Uh, two weeks ago, we held a meeting with our principals and district leaders, uh, and those efforts were for distancing. So how do we uh, adapt our distancing measures, increase that distance, um, so that it would, it would hopefully uh, curtail the spread uh, by doing that with furniture, uh, student pathways and hallways uh, and common areas. So we, we really worked and utilized on, on the best methods uh, to uh, have more one-way pathways and distance uh, provided between um, our, uh, our, our furniture uh, and just in spacing uh, and making sure we're, we're distance in that self space. So those were all efforts that we have taken. Um, you may have noticed recently that we started a vaccination clinic in each and every home football game. So we are offering uh, vaccination clinics at each and every home football game. Uh, we are also excited about, which is the, hence the reason for this agenda item, uh, about the, our efforts in air quality systems. So in just a moment, you'll hear some, uh, uh, the, really the, the science behind some air filtration systems that we believe will also help our community and help our school district. Uh, and one such system is in play right now at Glenn Middle School. So all these efforts uh, you know, work in concert with each other, uh, but we believe in uh, helping each other take personal responsibility and making an adjustment. I think we, every system in our community uh, must make adjustments uh, to help us get through this, uh, this trend. Um, but currently, we do have positive numbers uh, trending that way, and I'll let Dr. Gomez kind of talk about some of those specific numbers. For the week of 913 through 917, so this past week, we had 52 total students and four total staff members. That's a decrease by 70% for our students, where the week prior from 97, or excuse me, yes, 97 to 910, we had 176 students and 11 staff. The week prior to that, from 8.30 to 9.3, we had 206 students and 18 staff. Um, last Thursday, additionally, as we continue to see this positive trend, it was our first day to have zero high school or middle school student active cases. We only had four total student cases on that particular day and zero staff to report. So we are seeing that trend um, where numbers are decreasing. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gomez. And at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. McFarland uh, to kind of give a quick update on uh, the utilization of our ESSER funds and um, why those funds are allowing us to make additional purchases this year. Yes, sir, Mr. Parker, Dr. Detloff, members of the board. We've talked about these quote-unquote ESSER funds many times uh, over the summer and leading up into now. The ESSER, E-S-S-E-R, stands for Emergency or Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, that's categorized into many different types of um, federal aid that have been provided to school districts throughout the United States and provides opportunities for schools to determine best uses for those funds. One of the allowable uses in this particular type of federal fund that has not been available in many different types of federal fund sources is the opportunity to supplant uh, with your local money and use the local money in a different way. So in other words, the money when you use for ESSER does have certain tie-ins to it that are allowable by law and by the funding of the source that allow you to use it in certain ways. And then you can also use that to supplant with what you're doing now and take your general fund money and use that without the restrictions of the ESSER fund. So there's, there's multiple ways that we can utilize the money. However, um, from a district standpoint, what we're looking at in regard to available ESSER funds for the district over the next three years is approximately, um, it is 46 million of ESSER funding that the district has available to them. And so uh, a few of the uses there that if you're using it in ESSER funding ways is to allow for um, opportunities to mitigate the spread of the COVID or, or other types of airborne 
uh, transmissions of diseases. And so what it allows you to do is when you're dealing with filtration systems, whether that be mobile filtration systems or inline systems that are in your duct work, uh, those are allowable uses as well as, like I said before, um, and, and some of those, depending on the nature of them, if they, if they require a certain amount of instruct or construction, like going into your ductwork system and having to install things, uh, those would require, require some type of approval from uh, TEA and during that process as an allowable use. However, if you were to use that as a supplant and take your general fund money, you could use that without prior approval. Any questions I can answer there? Thank you, Dr. McFarland. I appreciate that. Um, also, as you know, um, the debate is loud with masking or not masking or what are the best protocols uh, to put in place to mitigate uh, the Delta variant. Um, and we believe that we have taken a methodical and logical approach as a school system uh, and really worked hard to have a unified effort uh, with other entities in our community uh, to try to take the best uh, course of action um, utilizing uh, input, uh, utilizing science, uh, information from our physicians, uh, as well as uh, trying to do the best things for kids and keep in-person school alive and well. So I, I think we know from past efforts that uh, you cannot replace uh, the uh, potential of an in-person education. And so I just appreciate all of our community coming together uh, to help us in San Angelo ISD do that. We know in this uh, situation, the last 18 months, when you receive information, it's outdated in about 72 hours. Uh, so part of the information we've received, we received on Friday. It's Monday. So it could be outdated, but we uh, try to uh, get information as quickly as possible from our legal counsel, uh, and we work through that. And uh, Mr. Parker now is going to talk to you about some of the impl implications uh, from a statewide perspective on uh, and some of the challenges and hurdles that we face uh, in looking at the best possible uh, safety measures for our kids. So I'll let Mr. Parker uh, talk about uh, the legalities of that uh, across our state. Thank you, Dr. Detloff. I, as an attorney, the board is, uh, is sometimes asks me about uh, legal matters, just like we rely on uh, Dr. Kingman for uh, medical matters. But uh, we have a uh, law firm that has uh, offices in several cities. The name of the firm is Walsh Gallegos. It's a very large uh, law firm that specializes in all phases of educational law. And I have been visiting with our uh, our friends there to keep us apprised for the last four or five weeks on uh, uh, what uh, options we have and uh, what's been going on across the state. Um, I've heard, learned this morning that the uh, last week there was a federal district court case in Austin that refused to rule against the governor's order about mass mandates. And this was one of the last opportunities that was in process for a statewide order to allow local school districts just to have local control on the issue. There was also a state district judge in Williamson County, which is Georgetown, that blocked the Round Rock ISD from enforcing a mask mandate. There, are, um, Ken Paxton, the Texas Attorney General, uh, has uh, recently sued at least 15 school districts which have not been complying with the governor's order. Uh, he's threatening to sue any other school district that does not follow the governor's order. Um, the, uh, our law firm in um, Austin, the Walsh Gagos firm that I mentioned, have said that the, uh, they've confirmed that uh, any funds that we use, um, that we would, if we wanted to, um, if we had to get in one of these fights, uh, all attorney fees have to be paid out of local funds. And uh, they do not expect the Texas Supreme Court to rule on this matter uh, on a statewide matter until October, maybe November, for any of the cases that are on appeal. So that kind of brings us up to date on where we are legally right now. Um, all right, with that said, now, J Jason Henry, if you'll come up and give us uh, more information about the air quality systems, the ventilation systems that uh, you and the other admin staff members have been studying. 
Dr. Detloff, members of the board, thank you for having me here today. Uh, for the past 18 months, we've experienced a global pandemic. San Angelo ISD has used several mitigation strategies to fight the COVID-19 virus. This includes encouraging good hygiene, social distancing, hand sanitizer throughout campuses, additional cleaning, cleaning procedures, spraying classrooms on an as-needed basis, and vaccination clinics. The district has embraced the current mitigation process and has begun researching air purification systems. These air purifiers operate with very little interaction from staff and operate 24 hours a day. Currently, we are looking in at the IVP purifiers, but other products could be added. IV IVP's venue model unit catches and kills COVID-19 in a single pass up to 99.99%. The biodefense technology has also kills anthrax, chicken pox, influenza, meningitis, streptococcus, measles, mumps, smallpox, and seasonal allergies such as pollen, ragweed, grass, and others. Right now I've got Dr. Garrett Peel from IVP. He's the CEO of IVP, and he's going to come up here and talk about this machine that we have. Dr. Detloff, thank you for the opportunity. Members of the board, I very much appreciate this. Um, chance to uh, share the science of IVP. Uh, a little bit about me, I, uh, I'm a Texan, I grew up in San Antonio. Um, I am I'm a general surgeon, I'm a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, and I also uh, hold a master's in health policy management from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, Monzer and I have worked together for almost uh, 15 years or so, and so at the end of March when he turned to me in his living room and he said, how in the world are we going to help get our children back to school safely? This was the inspiration of this invention. And since then, it has been uh, the only airborne solution endorsed by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, as well as being named Newsmaker of the Year by the Engineering News Record Team. And then they also named Monzer Harani the Engineer of the Year uh, for 2021 for uh, this invention and its rapid deployment. Um, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's and I'm a, a dad of four little girls, they're all in public school at, in Houston ISD. It's really about being proactive, like you've said, being uh, on the offense, not the defense. And if we've learned one lesson is how can we use our limited resources in a way uh, in, to invest in the infrastructure uh, to, to mitigate risk, but then also to um, really make an opportunity to set standards for these airstreams that we all breathe uh, and our children as well. And wouldn't it be great to be able to one day pick up your phone as a parent and check the air quality of your child in that classroom? And that's our goal. And with these filters, uh, you will see, I'm gonna play a couple videos and share a few slides, but uh, you will see uh, rapid progress that is truly based on science. This has been born here in Texas, and uh, our first school district was over a year ago. Um, at the governor's request, we installed to Slidell ISD, Taylor Williams, you'll see shortly, her testimony at the state capitol three weeks ago. Slidell ISD has had no student <coughs> cases and no contact tracing back for over one year. And she and others, to include uh, uh, Kelly Moulton, who is the superintendent of Galveston, uh, who is now uh, the, the superintendent of, 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 of the Texas Association of, of, of Superintendents as well, she testifies that uh, not only have we seen no contact tracing of students, but we also have seen uh, flu down and other communicable diseases down. This is a, a, a disinfection system that targets sub-micron viruses, but also combines HEPA technology. So, in essence, this catches and kills any kind of airborne pathogen instantaneously in a single pass. So, with that, um, I would like to uh, play a video.
So while we're IVP, um, IVP certainly um, it's it's innovative, right? It's uh, a technology that uh, is is nowhere else in the world, and uh, it's all research based. That was so important to Monzer that this was truly science based. Uh, certainly, it's award winning, and it is also FDA approved uh, for emergency use uh, during COVID nineteen. The five ten k requirement uh, was fulfilled, and we now have FDA approval. Uh, as I talked about, American Society of Mechanical Engineers and Engineering News Record named Monzer um, Engineer of the Year for this, and uh, it's, it's, it's really an exceptional honor. Um, he, just a bit about Monzer, uh, structural architect and engineer, uh, actually family uh, in West Texas. If, if, if truly we were able to install this uh, campus-wide, you would be the first innovative school district in West Texas to adopt this technology. Uh, we are in school districts throughout the state, um, from Banchetti to Comal, uh, to Houston ISD, uh, to Fort Worth and so on, but you would be the first West Texas school district. Um, and this was born out of the largest public-private partnership uh, in Texas related to COVID research. Uh, from um, the University of Houston, where superconductivity was um, essentially invented, to uh, Texas A&M. And Kathy Banks led her research team, who's now the president of Texas A&M. Um, and then we were the first aerosolized experiment that was a private experiment, uh, not related to the government, that looked at aerosolized SARS-CoV-2 actual SARS-CoV-2, so not a bacteriophage. Um, as you may know, Galveston National Lab is the anchor for the NIH, and Dr. Pessler, the chair there, led his team uh, because they believed in, in this innovative technology. Um, and so when we, we were in this data, we really were able to uh, show an instantaneous kill that led to a course of support uh, from people around the world. Uh, for example, Professor Paul ching Wu Chu, who is the Nobel Prize in Physics nominee, he invented superconductivity. And he said that this is the much needed single hope uh, in this depressing pandemic. Uh, keep in mind, this was at a time when people debated if this was airborne. And when Monzer turned to me and said, what are we going to do? I turned back to him and I said, well, you first have to educate people about what this virus is because we didn't even know that it was airborne. And now we know that it is suspended in the air for hours, uh, can be recirculated through ventilation systems and air streams. And in fact, we have evidence to show that even HEPA filters can, uh, certainly not effective to kill anything, but can actually be a super spreader of the virus. Uh, Dr. George Crabtree, uh, chair at Argonne National Lab where the atom bomb was uh, certainly invented. And, and he said that this is a mask for indoor ventilation. Uh, I want to also add that this invention, this technology, does not replace CDC guidance. It does not replace a mask. It does not replace social distancing. It does not replace hand washing and all of the wonderful things that you all have implemented. But what it does is provides an extra layer of security so that we can say our toolbox is armed with technology that we know if virus is in the air, it will kill it. And oh, by the way, we also clean the air uh, to mitigate other airborne disease. Kathy Banks uh, was the, the first team in history to show a sub-second kill of, of coronavirus. We used uh, this data uh, to actually make the, because it's using heat, right? We use heat, and so we used this research um, at 89 degrees Celsius. That's the lowest point that has ever been proven to kill uh, uh, coronavirus uh, instantaneously. And so that helped us because even at Galveston, we used a much higher temperature, around 150 C. Uh, and so uh, we are very thankful uh, to Dr. Banks and, and her team and their heroic efforts. This is, in a pandemic, it's incredible how much uh, work has gone into this in a very short period of time. Uh, MIT endorsed the technology as well. And so when we, when we got our first data from the Galveston National Lab, Dr. Pestler called um, Munzer and, and, and me and he said, um, this is incredible. He says, we've never seen anything like this before. And Munzer said, are you telling me I'm going to tell the world that we can kill actual SARS-CoV-2 instantaneously in the air when everyone doesn't even think it's in the air? And he said, yes, sir. He said, go back. I want more data. 
And so that's what we did. We got um, special privilege to increase the concentration of actual SARS-CoV-2 to the highest concentration that had ever been tested through a technology, 270 fold. And what we got is a more profound result. So we went from a three to four log reduction to a five to seven log reduction. And then Dr. Pessler said, if you can kill anthrax just 50% of the pass, then you can really say that this technology disinfects the air, which could be applicable to all kinds of other things. And so, yet again, we did that and uh, increased the concentration of billions of spores 4.5 fold and got a 99.98% pass. Um, I'm a surgeon, as you know, and, and, and we test the air in the operating room for spores. We don't test the air for virus or uh, bacteria or mold necessarily, but if you have spores in our operating room, you know you're in trouble. And so this is why uh, we chose to uh, push anthrax through it. And so it's, it's really not only just a, a fight and a mitigation to COVID-19 transmissibility, but it also prepares us for the future. COVID may stay for a long time, and there may be other variants, and this will kill any variant because it's not about the protein coat, it's about the size of the virus. So it's a sub-second 0.1 micron size. This led to a, a peer review paper uh, with uh, uh, world uh, attention, 2.5 billion uh, uh, news stories. Uh, but if you look at this title, it's really important, Catching and Killing of Airborne SARS-CoV-2 uh, by a Heated Air Disinfection System. So it's a catch and kill phenomenon. We're, we're integrating the, the best filtration we have with HEPA filtration, 99.97, with the biodefense filter together using heat, but it does not impact the ambient air and is energy efficient. There are a lot of competing messages on the market. And I will say that we don't reduce, we don't capture, we don't eliminate, or we don't absorb. We actually catch and kill at the heart of the filter is a highly porous material. It's a nickel foam mesh stainless steel um, proprietary alloy. And it is 99.99% uh, uh, porous. And it's very highly resistant, so it can always be charged. And when that filter has a charge, uh, it creates the van der Waal forces that attract the biological to it. So we think about it as almost a colander when we're cooking spaghetti. We put the spaghetti in in the water, and the water goes out, but the spaghetti stays in. This is exactly what's happening here. The virus is being pushed through this filter, slowed down by the HEPA, but then killed with the biodefense filter. And so as we look to the future, this can truly revolutionize our airstreams and the biology of air quality. This probably is one of the more important slides of the night. This is Dr. Pessler, and he says that given its effectiveness against spores, this technology offers hope for biodefense against any airborne pathogens to mitigate influenza and other future pathogens. So it prepares us for the future. It arms us with enhanced technology and infrastructure that we need to make sure that the airstream is protecting um, our, our, our valuable air that our children, teachers, and staff are, are, are breathing every second of the day. Um, we went to work quickly. There are three models right now, uh, as in addition to uh, the HVAC solution. The filter was integrated into um, these mobile units, and one of which is right here. If you think about it, how do you mitigate person-to-person -person transmission of COVID? You do it by pumping the cleanest, freshest, viral-free air into the environment as possible by diluting the viral load and decreasing that person-to-person -person transmission. And this filter in this powerful circulation accomplishes that very well. The venue unit is about 1,800 CFM with uh, a cleaning of about 30,000 to 60,000 cubic feet, depending upon the density of the room. The room unit, uh, uh, school districts are using this in classrooms. Uh, it has a variable speed, so you can turn it up uh, when the classroom instruction is, is over or when then there is movement in the room to clear out as much uh, air as possible. Uh, and this pushes through about um, uh, 1,000 square feet every, every 15 to 16 minutes. It also exceeds ASHRAE standards uh, threefold. So ASHRAE says all you should have is a HEPA filter with a fan that turns the room twice an hour. And I will argue that that is insufficient to mitigate anything. The 
smaller unit, uh, our hope is one day um, through this humanitarian effort of Bonzer's, this is a humanitarian effort, uh, that, that this tabletop unit um, will be able to be on every teacher's desk and every child's desk in the future. We're actually um, uh, evolving the smaller unit so that it's battery chargeable and, and smaller that actually can uh, be carried around for, from uh, potentially classroom to classroom. But um, again, Monzer's vision and his inspiration is about how to keep children safe in school. And so uh, uh, that tabletop unit is really for face-to-face -face mitigation. And we've launched uh, several channels uh, through uh, not only healthcare, but also schools and uh, entertainment venues, as you'll see shortly. Um, who we are versus everyone else. Uh, for example, our, um, our representative competitor for the FDA is the Molecule device. You may have known about this. It's more of a residential solution. When you look at the science, it basically tells the story. We offer an instantaneous kill with a single pass without impacting the ambient air using heat. The Molecule device is a 99.4% kill in 30 minutes in a closed space using UV light. UV light is not an airborne solution. It's a contact kill solution. And then we've also been able to uh, adapt the filter for installation into air handler units. And in so doing, uh, right now, most air filters across the world are, are even less than a MERV 11. If I can uh, have you focus on this briefly, this is probably the second most important slide of the evening. Um, a MERV 11 or even a 13, a lot of schools are investing in MERV 13s. Um, this captures only 50 to 85% of the particles. It doesn't kill anything, and it's like a chain link fence with a fly going through it in relation to the virus. And so when you even advance that to HEPA technology as found in healthcare, we know that that HEPA technology requires a 0.3 micron size to at least block the flow. Coronavirus is 0.1 micron. And so in order for a HEPA filter, the best that we have in the world, to work, that virus has to be suspended in the air to a particle greater than 0.2 to 0.3 microns. And most particles, say water vapor, right? are less than 0.2 microns. This was a landmark study in Nature. This was um, released um, about nine months ago. Uh, they looked at HEPA filters in a Swedish hospital. They were able to show that the HEPA filter not only did not kill any virus, but what it did is it provided a, a milieu for replication of the virus in the filter. And then they were able to track variants of the virus from one floor to the other Air handler units are super spreaders of the disease. And not many people are, are talking about that right now, but they soon will be. Two days after this study was released, the CDC said that there is insufficient evidence to say that COVID-19 is a contact transmissible disease. This was a landmark paper. And so we very much went to work quickly, and we were able to uh, manufacture this filter, get it installed. For example, this is the headquarters uh, of uh, the Irvine companies out in California, meeting code. This is a sample of an installation in an air handler unit. Um, static pressure is less than one uh, column inch per 500, meeting all the requirements of that. Uh, this replaces your MERVs and or your HEPAs. Uh, but what it also does is in disinfecting the air, you don't have to rely on bringing that hot air from the outside, that air mix from the outside. And so uh, it is more energy efficient, and you can rely on that recirculation of the plume in the indoor space because with every single pass, you're, you're, you're creating success uh, to that airstream. Uh, and lastly, heat. Everyone's worried about heat because we're using heat. And uh, the differential of heat is about 0.5 uh, Celsius right after the filter. But in the ambient air, uh, there is, there's no difference. And uh, we have a lot of data to show that. Um, and um, we'll show that video. Um, I do want to mention this briefly. Uh, very early after our announcement in July of 2020, uh, we worked closely with the, the Disney company uh, to adapt the Wells Riley equation so that we can actually educate people about what the risk is. If one person enters a room, what is that relative risk reduction? The higher the relative risk reduction, the lower the risk of mitigation. And what we found through a lot of 
diligent modeling and a lot of science about this, uh, we've been able to uh, calculate a probability of infection. So we can go into your schools and provide an educated evaluation based upon the science of the data. Is this what filter it is? What is the air mix? How many people are in the room? Even control for mask wearing what that relative risk reduction is. And if you look at it, the CDC guidance baseline is about three to 10% relative risk reduction. This is mask wearing, this is social distancing, this is a 50% air mix, and this is a MERV 11. When you add an IVP unit to the, to the space, that relative risk reduction needs 90%. When you add an HVAC filter to that mobile unit in certain high density spaces, you're about 95%. So that is data to show that this works. We have full certifications from EPA to NAFA to ASHRAE meeting those requirements as well as ISO and CE. And then we've worked, worked with TRAIN uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, this was Slidell. We were uh, featured in USA Today. See those little ones uh, without masks? That was a special day for us in, in August. But you can see how we've um, certainly evolved uh, very quickly. Uh, also in Miami, we Monzo wanted to uh, target the highest risk states first. And so we went to uh, places like Miami when all the schools were not open in Miami, this school was, and it stayed open without contact tracing back to any classroom that this mobile unit was in. Very exciting. Um, some of the other ISDs we've worked with, and um, uh, even for little ones, right? The, 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 the pediatric population is at high risk, certainly. Um, and I think it's important that we, we say that vaccines are good, they're, they're helpful, but they do not mitigate transmission of the disease. You can be fully vaccinated and pass the disease on to an unvaccinated person. And so we need an extra layer of security to help that. So there are other technologies that we have to look toward to, to certainly enhance vaccine and or mask wearing and CDC guidance. Um, we've talked about Galveston, but St. Paul uh, is a Head Start program out of San Antonio, right in, uh, in, in downtown. And they called and said, we have been closed five times by the state because our infection rate is 20% plus. We immediately deployed units there and we got the infection rate from 22% down to 5% in several months. They have yet to close since our deployment. So that's, that's, that's really exciting. Um, and uh, places uh, like uh, forward fitting to Texas A&M University. Uh, uh, this is uh, in the medical center at Maine and Holcomb. Uh, this is a student tower building as well as a uh, uh, biomedical, medical, and uh, life science tower that will be forward fit working with U UH. We are deployed from um, the Stewart Healthcare System to University Health System to UTMB and to MD Anderson, as well as to the number one hospital in the state of Texas, Methodist Hospital. Uh, not only have we deployed in their Texas Medical Center campus, but uh, we are deploying to their 11 other um, uh, campuses throughout Houston. So a lot of due diligence has been We've been going through this uh, very carefully. Uh, about a month after we launched, people said, Dr. Peel, how do we know this really works? And so I said, well, doing a research study on COVID-19 is really difficult because you have to know who has it in order to do the study and collect the data. So we partnered with Post Acute Medical. They have um, uh, many COVID-19 hospitals and rehabilitation centers throughout the US. Um, and we were able to also partner with Air Answers, which was a, is a third party certified uh, COVID-19 um, measurement company certified by the CDC. And what we did is we basically found that um, uh, in these patients, in about 28 of them, 80% uh, of them had airborne COVID in the air, despite negative pressure ventilation. And then of those, 80% had high levels of COVID in the air based on CT levels as designated by the CDC. And then we looked at our machine directly. The air goes through the bottom, goes through the top, and it does that because we want to dilute that suspended virus in the air uh, to, to provide that extra ventilation of clean air. And what we found, uh, thankfully, was that uh, a lot of it at the bottom, obviously, but none of it at the top. Um, this is early data. It was accepted by uh, Science Magazine, and, and it will be published soon. But uh, after three hours, there was, there was no measurable COVID in the air in any of those rooms. So um, we are uh, thankful to our, our, our research partners for that. Again, um, TDEM and, and the governor was our first customer.
and he deployed uh, this technology to uh, the highest risk areas across the state to include nursing homes as well as um, uh, buildings uh, in regards to DPS. We are in the bunker uh, to protect him and others. Uh, work closely with Disney, obviously. Uh, also American Airlines, we were able to uh, in increase their population uh, at the IOC. This is the main nucleus for the world, for American right here up in Dallas, uh, from 10% in December to 60% in May, and now they're at 80% occupancy. Uh, so we feel that we've contributed some, uh, if, if not a lot, to that reopening, and their COVID numbers are, are non-existent. Um, and, and they have not made a vaccine mandate yet either. Uh, so we're uh, across the country also working with uh, the FAA to deploy this in air airlines, which is exciting for us as well, um, a heated HEPA system. Uh, George R. Brown Convention Center was one of our very first deployments in Houston, and they have been able to um, uh, get back to about 91% of their original um, customer list uh, over this past year, whereas, say, others across the country are not even open yet. Uh, we were at the Super Bowl, as well as being main, named a brand standard for Hilton, um, as well as Peninsula Hotels and soon-to-be Intercontinental Hotels as well, uh, and then also working with Fortune 500 companies in their reopening strategy across the country. Uh, working closely with uh, the largest senior living community, we are deployed uh, at Canyon Ranch. So if you visit Vegas, you'll see these um, and uh, getting people back to uh, their spa activities. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, this is, is how I'll end the slide presentation. We work very closely with uh, uh, the Michigan State Police as well as the, the chief of um, well, sheriff of Wayne County. He called in December. And he said, Dr. Peel, we have big problems. I don't know who you are, but I need to meet with you. We met with him by Zoom, and he said, I've lost three doctors. I've lost six correctional um, uh, staff members, and I have a, an infection rate that's over 25%. He said he used uh, grant money. We deployed that through the correctional system. Unfortunately, he passed away um, a week before we deployed these. Uh, but uh, their rate uh, drastically was reduced. In fact, they were um, designated by CDC as, as, a, as a top uh, uh, correctional facility uh, for their efforts uh, to, to get their numbers down. And uh, Monzer's working, obviously, on uh, new things on the horizon, like the large venue unit uh, to help, uh, for example, in airports and other convention centers. And um, with that said, I'd really like to show that video. The first video I'd like to show is just an overview of an installation of an HVAC unit. It could be helpful. This is at uh, train headquarters in, in, in Houston. Patience is virtuous.
We have a, a strong IVP technology filter, as you can see already. We'll give this about one more minute, and yep. then we'll uh, just provide a, a summary and move through the agenda. So if there we'll are questions, I can minute. be answering questions at this time. Yes. Thank you. With COVID yeah, most 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 of most of the schools right now are focusing on high risk areas, putting mobile units in place. Yes. And exactly yes, and 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 schools are uh, looking to use SR monies to integrate the filter into the air handler unit as well as that extra layer of security. The, the filter is, on, is two years, so it's a value add that you don't have to change the MIRVs every three to six months. So it's every, uh, every two years, and we do a lifetime warranty on the filter. So uh, HEPAs usually require a change after 24 months. With COVID-19 threatening the health of every American student, it's time to provide cleaner air and safer schools with the world's only biodefense indoor air protection system. This affordable mobile plug and purify device, invented by Monzer Harani, is proven to catch and kill actual coronavirus, instantly destroying COVID-19, anthrax spores, and other airborne contaminants. Airborne pathogens like COVID-19 are dangerous because they move easily with air currents, making common air circulation systems one of our worst enemies when it comes to transmission. A simple cough can launch millions of viruses into the air, or they're drawn into air ventilation systems, spreading the virus into other rooms. This patent-pending heated filter helps to stop the spread of the virus without significantly heating the ambient air, and provides powerful circulation, moving 1,800 cubic feet per minute, and recirculating the air in a classroom more than 10 times per hour. The Biodefense Indoor Air Protection System can be adapted for larger spaces and is also available for installation into existing school HVAC systems. This technology is safe, effective, and scientifically proven to destroy the coronavirus instantaneously, purifying the air in our schools and protecting our students and teachers so they can breathe with confidence. Just one more brief one, but um, to answer your question, sir. Yes. Yes, and, and some school districts are choosing to invest in classrooms as well. The room unit, the room unit, yeah, Th a thousand square feet every 15 minutes, and in fact, Galveston, um, you know, they they were they developed a program where they moved them from classroom to classroom throughout the day because again, it's it's all about decreasing that risk, it marge, you know, maximizing that percentage of of, of relative risk reduction, uh, and so in K through 12, uh, they they focus specifically on large venue areas for the venue units, and then uh, room units for their elementary schools. And they put in, uh, they did another second order to uh, go into other spaces as well. Uh, well, they, they have, uh, in, in most of their elementary schools, they have actually four classrooms, and so they did two and two, and they would do half the day and half the day, so that, that uh, there was equality in the, in the distribution of the technology. Yes, yes, sir. Uh -huh. in, in, so in a normal classroom, you're getting four to six turns an hour, uh, so, uh, you know, better than the ASHRAE standard. There. Okay, here we go. Thank you again for the time. I appreciate it, and I'll I'll uh, surrender all my my time to, to whoever's next. <laughs> Potentially, one of the most important press conferences that I ever was engaged with in my life.
what has drawn me to IVP, to work with Monza Barani, who I happen to think is a genius. This is not just about COVID-19. This is about influenza. This is potentially about strep and other pathogens that this takes out of the air and kills. The University of Texas Medical Branch. When you've got the University uh, uh, of Houston and the Superconductivity Institute, Dr. Wren, that you oversee, when you've got the engineering school at Texas A&M, when you have the uh, infectious disease lab in Galveston, Texas, basically a national lab, when you have individuals associated with MIT and Argonne National Labs, that science, from my perspective, is what I will stand with and behind. They deployed on the first day of school, and this was last year, and I'm proud to say that we did not close school one day last school year, nor did we quarantine. We had 98% of our kids in person from the first day of school to the last day of school, and that uh, our educational gaps were not as big as a lot of schools are facing because we were able to have our kids in school every single day. This is so easy to install. They literally showed up, and two days later, the entire campus of Slide LISD is completely covered by these machines. If anybody thinks that our smaller school districts in Texas are not leaders in innovation, they just hadn't been to Slide L, they hadn't been to Wise County, Texas. IVP's technology was certified as not only killing the SARS-CoV virus at 99.999% on the first pass, but also the Amtrak scores. We have a Center for Technology Innovation at the Texas Hospital Association where we look for nascent, emerging, leading edge technology that will help our hospitals serve their mission of patient care more effectively, more efficiently, more successfully. Good afternoon. You may feel very strange that I have a mask on. Well, it's because the air is not clean. That's why we need a mask. However, I think it's not because we have this machine here. And the purpose of these machines are suck air in and then release the clean air out. And then inside, there is a filter. This filter can take any particles in the air above like 0 0.2 microns with the efficiency 99.97%. And this machine circulates the air six to eight times per hour. You have seen what restaurants have done to overcome and we're really happy to have partnered with IVP. We need more innovation in this space in order to keep restaurants safe and their workers safe as well. We had no, at all of our campuses, no spread that was detected to be at the campus level. They all came from outside. We were able to provide for over 100 units for Galveston ISD. There were various variety of the room units that you see behind you. This is something that the school can't do. Really, we need to have this as a key public health policy. Big problems call for bigger solutions. And today, as most schools are open in Texas, back to face-to-face -to -face learning, which is so important, we are still on the defense when it comes to fighting and winning the war against COVID-19. This is an additional layer of protection to masks, to vaccines, to social distancing, and other CDC guidelines. This is a layer of protection to give us a sense of security to have a normal life again. Again, appreciate the time. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Peel. Jason? At this time, we're looking for a little bit of guidance from the board. Uh, the administration recommends continuing, continued purchase of the portable air purification systems on an as-needed basis for campuses. Cooperative purchasing agreements that are in place will be used to facilitate these purchases. Uh, what we're looking for from the board is a direction of how we want to go about uh, how many and where we would like to put them. Well, let me add, I'll, I'll put it back on the admin staff. You guys have been studying it. What, what do you think is a good starting point 
for us to start this? And where, where do you suggest um, we put the units to start off? So, Mr. Parker, let me provide a little background information in our discussions, and then uh, Mr. Henry can uh, certainly give more specific uh, feedback. Uh, I think one of the options would be to uh, place the unit, such as behind Mr. Henry, uh, the large unit, uh, place that unit in all secondary cafeterias and gymnasiums. Um, so that would be one option. Uh, and these options may be uh, coupled together uh, or um, certainly taken individually. Another option would be to uh, place one of the mobile units at each elementary school uh, and allow them to transfer that unit uh, into spaces that they deem necessary, whether that's a gymnasium, uh, cafeteria, um, and then certainly a third option, uh, but you know, even with uh, additional ESSER funds, there's a cost, uh, so we would need to uh, calculate the cost. Uh, but also, I don't think, you know, when you think about, uh, we know that there's going to be a variant of some, uh, of some nature, probably in the foreseeable future in the next couple of years. So uh, for me, you know, it, it again goes back to, um, you know, the cost, which when you look at the price of you know educating kids in a safe environment tends to be to, tends to be priceless. So um, I think those are all, we have ESSER funds to do this. So a third option would be to uh, look at um, individual classroom units or perhaps the uh, AC filter units. Um, this is the first uh, presentation I've heard on the specific classroom units or uh, AC filter units. And again. Uh, whatever decision is made tonight, uh, we can certainly add on and build to that decision. Um, so these are some options available right now. Uh, if we want to get one unit in the hands of every campus or department, uh, and then we can certainly build on that option uh, as we as we move through. So I'll let uh, Mr. Henry add to that, or uh, again, he may have some more specifics. I think we're on the same page, Dr. Detloff. I'm the we discussed starting off with uh, putting, we've, at this point we've purchased five units and uh, our intent is to hit every high school and second, all the secondaries with them and then possibly purchase one for each of the gyms as well. And then we, I have worked with or contacted other companies as well uh, to look into other technologies just to make sure that we're covering all our bases and we'll continue to so as we kind of layer our technology, one possibility is to uh, provide a, a, a single IVP unit at every campus, um, and then we can layer that with other technologies or uh, filtration systems, uh, whether that be uh, IVP or uh, from other vendors. Um, but I, I think uh, we do want to move quickly because I think we're right in the throes of the pandemic. Uh, our numbers are trending well, but it would be a great opportunity um, to, to move forward with some action. Jason, when we uh, discussed earlier the gymnasiums, including Central Oaks, uh, let's just piece it by secondary first. For every gymnasium and cafeteria at secondary, what would that be? 15. 15 units. And then we have 17 elementary campuses right now. Uh, so we could purchase a unit uh, for each uh, elementary campuses. I'm not certain of the cost uh, per unit uh, for these smaller units. Uh, but again, we can have a layered approach where we do purchase a device uh, for every campus. And I'm open for any discussion or input or add-ons or critiques. This isn't my usual mic. I have to actually hold the button. Sorry. Um, so, like we've all talked about, this technology is novel technology. It's great technology. They have better data than a lot of things. When you look at a lot of the, even the CDC studies that have come out with some of the filters that are being recommended, their some of their data has not been as rope near as robust as this data. So, all of that being said, it is still new technology and there, it's emerging everywhere. Um, and I'm not an expert like Dr. Peel on IVP by any means or anything else. What I, all I'm saying is I want us to make sure that we are probably start, what I would want to do would be start with our high density areas, 
that and possibly elementary, you know, one for every elementary. But this, as this technology emerges, there are other th options that are possibly going to become available. And we want to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're doing it in a stepwise fashion so that we aren't duplicating cost to do the exact same thing down the road. Meaning if we may decide over the next month that IVP is what we want in our HVAC systems, et cetera. But I think we should do our due diligence to make sure that we're not going to put IVP in our HVAC systems and then use E3 or some other vendor that we've used previously and have duplicate technologies that aren't really giving us any additional benefit. Um, so I guess from my standpoint, I mean, obviously I've, I've been reading on this stuff for a little while, um, but I think the technology with this is good enough, or the data with this is absolutely supportive of us going ahead and buying some of these units. I mean, obviously we've already bought some of them. Um, and I don't think that just because we buy 30 of them, which is roughly 32, 33, whatever, you, um, is going to um, be the end all to be all so that everything works, but on the same hand, um, that may give us opportunities to deploy them in our cafeterias, on our elementary campuses, places that are circulating a significant number of children through quickly and our current HVAC system is not doing anything in those areas to mitigate the risk. Um, and so in our high density areas, I think it would be, it makes a lot of sense to start out with. So Dr. Kingman, attempting to summarize some of your comments, I, we have 17 elementaries, uh, three middles, basically 24 campuses. Um, and then if you add gymnasiums to that, uh, are you thinking, Dr. Hen or Mr. Henry, that maybe the number Dr. Keeman quoted, somewhere between 32 and 35 units would cover the, uh, the large spaces um, yeah. and provide a unit at each campus? Where, uh, again, that could be mobile. Uh, if there's an area of need, they could take that unit there. It should. And yeah. I think that would be one layer. Um, well, and I also think having multiple units would allow for us, the way this virus works, if we have a campus that is popping or having a significant number of positive cases, it would allow us to move units from throughout the district to that campus in order to try and mitigate risk in, that, in those groups and then return them to wherever they need to be on cam where their home campus. But just because it's, you know, San, Jack San Jacinto's or Fort Concho's machine, if they don't have any cases, and while we don't want them to have any cases, but Glenn has a significant number of cases, we could move units, deploy units universally. So I, I don't think we by any means want to label them as specific to a, dish to a campus although that may be where they live as a home, I think we want to be able to have the flexibility to deploy them where the need is. And Dr. Gomez, uh, I know you were helping us with our technology, but uh, for example, right now, uh, you know, kind of using that, that, that frame of thinking, um, currently how many campuses have positive student cases? So again, if there was a campus that we see many positive cases, let's just take an elementary, for example, you could even move one of these units into each grade level uh, or each wing, uh, facility wing if needed. So I know our, our numbers are trending downward. Well, she's looking at that. Dr. Peel, these come with a warranty. And you do just plug them in, right? <laughs> There's not a battery here. Or... So currently, like Altaloma, Bel Air, Bonham, those are all single digits, though. Um, if you looked at higher, kind of, you have uh, more of our secondary campuses, Central Maine. That would be one where we could locate one Multiple. of those um, because. There, with the student population, too, on that campus, there, there are multiple. Uh, Lincoln would be another one. 
as we kind of go through and monitor active cases. Were there single cases? Those first couple of campuses, those were single cases. Um, the last two secondary examples I gave you would be campuses where we have um, some. And right now our student positive cases are under 1% correct. of our total enrollment. Yes. One thing that I was really interested in is that it also captures um, strep and flu and with us coming up on the flu season and right now um, my daughter goes to Glenn and there's a large issue with strep at Glenn right now and some of the other schools. I, I'm really interested in this working not just for the COVID that we're dealing with now that, you know, maybe you know, could be declining and hopefully in the near future, but, um, or maybe not, but also other um, health issues as we go forward. I just think moving forward that we would, I would like to find out the cost of the smaller, you know, the, you know, the individual classroom ones. I mean, I, th I think it would be great to have them in each classroom. <laughs> Turn your mic off, please. <laughs> no. But yeah, that's what I'd like to find out, if we could get that information from Dr. Bill later. Thank you. What do you need to, tonight? Do we need to give you specific numbers? I know we don't have to take bids. We've got this through the co-op. I'm, I'm thinking at a minimum we need to do what we discussed, the 30 to 35. Um, you know, there's certain things I know people are going to, in a few minutes we're going to speak about mass mandates and there's things that we as a board say it's difficult for us to do because we have orders that we can or can't do things uh, but I don't think we need to just sit around and and uh, not be proactive this is a way that I think uh, we can be proactive and I think it's in a positive way it's uh, as Dr. Peel has said these institutions that uh, he's mentioned that are utilizing uh, this product are uh, very impressive and um, so I, I but I also agree with Dr. Kingman that we don't have to uh, uh, go all out right now and, and uh, until we have a, a more of a chance to research if, if this is where we need to put all our efforts or we need to utilize uh, other companies for other things but I think uh, again with uh, what Amy said we don't want to delay uh, or Dr. Detloff, uh, we don't want to delay this. It's time to do something, and we need to do it quickly. I, I don't know if it was said, but uh, are these units available? Is this something that's li like, uh, I don't want this to be like a new pickup. They're just like, yeah, they're, they're available, but we don't have a microprocessor and, you know, microchip, and they won't be in until, you know, uh, next summer. But is this something that are available quickly? This, this one, I actually called them on a Tuesday, and they delivered it to Glenn on a Thursday. And as far as operation of the machine, it took me longer to find the light switch at Glenn than it did to get this thing running. You plug it in and hit the button, and that was it. So, And the maintenance, I know you mentioned it, but uh, once you plug it in, once we're using it, um, is it how, how often do we need to do something with it? After sale is coordinated through our distributor with uh, Hutton Group of Houston. They're the largest distributor for train in the country. And so uh, there's really not a lot of maintenance whatsoever, but if there's any issues, they will handle all the after sale. Um, the, the filter is changed every two years. It's a couple hundred dollars, the filter. And then um, the, the, the unit is, we ask that the unit be wiped down for a couple of weeks just for dust and, and debris. Thank you. Any other board member, Lapita, anybody? So, so very little maintenance. These are plug and, and, and disinfect. It's, it, it, we've, we've been able to uh, design this unit so that it does not need a lot of care other than turn on and turn off and uh, wiping down, like I said, for, for dust. 
You can move it. Move it everywhere, okay. Versatile. How much are the filters? We've, we know we all got pricing on the units, but the filter. So the replacement filter is on average about 150 to 200 dollars, depending upon if it's the small one or the large one. Uh, but uh, that's that's where those come, in, and that will uh, we'll be happy to provide that. And and if I may, in regard to the future and, and other technologies, I would just ask: show us how you can kill SARS-CoV-2 instantaneously in a single pass. That's the true question. No one can say that. Okay. Thank you. So, yes, sir, Mr. Parker, if it would, whatever would be the most helpful, uh, we believe that as an administration now, based on your feedback, we can make a, a recommendation, and then um, certainly you guys, if, if you choose to do so, could make a motion or approve that motion. Um, so, however, or if you just... Uh, as a board member, uh, someone can certainly make a, a motion as well, or we can make a recommendation, and then you can make a motion. I can make a motion. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'd make a motion to approve based on um, administration's recommendations for anywhere from 30 to 40 of these units once we look at um, numbers, but 30 to 40 of these units for our high density, high risk areas uh, initially with the possibility of coming back to the board for further uh, recommendations in the future. Mr. Parker, I'd second that motion on, and on the fact that also if it's, if it's uh, the unit is 99.9% .9 effective against streptococcus, uh, some of the flu uh, strains that are out there and some other issues uh, should help also keep kids in school beyond just the COVID issue that we have. Um. Becky, is that specific enough? Yes. No, I mean just saying 30 to 40. Is that specific enough that, that we can? All right. Then we've had a motion by Dr. Kingman and a, uh, and a second by Mr. Dindle to that uh, we look at uh, purchasing uh, 30 to 40 of these units. Um, and I'm, I think what we're right now we're talking about the larger units. Yes. All right. Is there any other board discussion? Uh, is there any public discussion about uh, the uh, air quality systems, ventilation units? Mr. Parker. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I, I, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. You need to go up because uh, we're we're recording this, and we need to have you uh, speak at the microphone, please. Be sure to introduce yourself. Good evening. My name is Randall Minton. I'm a substitute teacher for SAISD. Uh, I, I've been taking some quick notes. And um, basically, I'm looking at, okay, what is the life of the machine? What is the cost? After all, we the people paying taxes, we want to know how much it costs. Uh, the availability, are they going to be available? I think that was already... I answered, uh, and the filters, uh, just because when he was uh, talking about the filters and they're part of the machine and this, that, and the other, uh, can these filters in the future, and I guess this is uh, to you, uh, you know, broken down to a smaller unit so that they could actually be used in the face mask that we're using. We know uh, that really the face masks are just a facade. They do very little to prevent the, uh, you know, small germs from getting in. So, you know, if this filter that you have in this machine is something that could be, you know, micro-sized or something, that that would be something that I, I would want to put as a, as a thought to the uh, people that are, um, you know, making these and making changes, so forth and so on. And also, uh, how often does it does the filter have to be changed? Two years. And um, what is the power usage of this machine? Thank you. 
Mr. Henry to address the cost of that. Mr. Henry, would you address the cost? I, I know the board uh, knows it, but I don't know if it's uh, something that's been mentioned tonight. I uh, believe it was even right. uh, written in the media. Yes, the, the, cost. Uh, the list cost on the the list cost is fourteen thousand. We negotiate. Well, I negotiated down with uh, Mr. Dr. Peel down to ten thousand a unit. Now, with us buying thirty units, I'm sure that there'll be a an additional discount as well. Okay, and that's okay. As far as the uh, the filters, I think you said they last for two years. Two years. And also, Monzer is working on. Okay, did that get? Did we answer your questions, Mr. Minton? I think they most of those were done. I mean, this is uh, as uh, Mr. McFarland had stated earlier. Uh, we've got extra funds here. This is we're talking about three to four hundred thousand uh, dollars, if I'm calculating correctly, and um, so. We have room to add more in the future if we need to, but this will be a, I think, would be a good start. All right. Uh, are we ready? Uh, any, any other public comment, or are we ready to call for a vote? All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All aye. opposed, say no. The motion passes. All right. For those of you who have been waiting patiently, I uh, appreciate you uh, waiting. Uh, and I do want to say, uh, Dr. Peel, again, thank you for being here. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't ask. Where are you from? San Antonio. San Antonio. Thank you for... All right. Well, thank you for being here. All right. We have several. I uh, assume there, everybody is still here, and I'm going to uh, call. There's one, two, three, four, five persons that have signed up to speak. Everyone is signed up saying a mask in school. So... Please uh, limit your comments to three to five minutes. Um, Chelsea Hurd, you're the first on my list. And keep this in mind, I don't know if I said it in my earlier comments, items that are not on our agenda, the board uh, will listen to, but I think you know that we can't um, have discussions about things because it hadn't been posted, so I don't want you to feel like we don't care because we're not able to, uh, to uh, give you any comments back, okay? Um, my name is Chelsea Hurd. I'm the parent of a current student at SAISD. Um, I strongly encourage you guys to implement some sort of mask rule, especially for those who are not old enough to be vaccinated in school right now. Um, I was comforted by the new technology that was discussed tonight, and I think Masks in conjunction with these new um, technologies would be a great way to ensure that our students can be safe and stay in school and keep our schools open. Um, I heard your comments about how mask mandates are hard to get around legally currently, but if the school district can police rips and jeans, shoulder straps, hair, color, stuff like that, I don't understand why we couldn't put a mask rule in our dress code policies. Um, and a lot was covered today, so that cut my comments a lot shorter. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hurd. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hurd. Um, next is Devin Hurd. Can't really talk with this. Good evening, board. My name is Devin Hurd. I'm a father of a current student attendee attending Lone Star Middle School. Integrity has been drilled into my into me as soon as the son of the so, of a soldier, as an athlete, as a scholar, and as a current soldier. Doing the right thing without being told. Doing the right thing when no one is watching. I'm filled with, with profound disappointment to know that my daughter's school district has no integrity when it comes to the clear and present danger we face with this continued global. Why is my daughter's life less important 
than the kind of jeans she wears to school? Why is her safety less important than des designated drop-off points and pickup points? You can implement all kinds of rules, but a life-saving mask mandate where you draw the line. The current district-wide COVID protocols are filled with oxymoron and hypocrisy. Last month, I attempted to drop off uh, my daughter's lunch because she forgot it. I was told I couldn't give it to her because of COVID protocols, and that I would have to sign her out and she would have to eat off campus. I was told uh, this by someone who was not wearing a mask and was surrounded by massless staff. Clearly, everyone in the front office doesn't believe in a very real virus, so why would they bother by my daughter's lunch? Whether it arrived at 7 a.m. or 11 a.m., this doesn't make sense that I can't. So my daughter had to sit in my truck, um, eat her lunch before she went to uh, ASU game that the school transported to her. So where's the logic coming from that? Her coming out to my truck only added another point of potential exposure before heading right back into the school building. Schools are supposed to be a safe place and it's currently the most dangerous place my daughter has been, has to be in for 45 hours. So I just ask you that you look into mandate and policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. <laughs> Kaylee Cortez. Hi, my name is Kaylee. I'm a seventh grader at Lone Star Middle School. This month has been my first opportunity to participate, per, participate in school athletics. I'm on the volleyball and swim team. I went on spring break when I was in fifth grade at Austin Elementary and never got to see my teachers again. I started middle school, uh, I started middle school online having no clue what my teachers even looked like. I'm vaccinated, I wear my mask, I'm doing what science, scientists and doctors tell me what to do. If you don't mandate masks, there won't be enough healthy athletes and coaches to continue a season of any sport. Growing up military, I have friends all over the world. In Hawaii, I'm told only fully vaccinated kids who wear their masks can play sports. Their parents cheer for them on Zoom. If we only man mandated half of those precautions, you could assure me that me and my teammates would me and my teammates could have a full season. Anything less will almost certainly aid in another devastating loss of normalcy for us kids. I have medically, I have medically diagnosed asthma. Almost everyone, including me, who goes to Shannon's gym wears their masks while working out. I've seen them doing this for over a year now. Wearing a mask hasn't killed them or stopped them from working out. COVID will. To be honest, most of us kids don't really mind the masks. Masks reduce the spread of germs, but as a middle schooler, I can tell you we are grateful that they cover <laughs> acne and braces. Please do what is right. Protect me, my friends, my coaches, and my teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. Mr. Ramon. Dr. Detloff, Mr. Parker, remaining members of the board. Here to uh, just kind of reiterate a lot of things that uh, some of my friends, colleagues, and peers have mentioned. Um, when school was first deployed home, to my knowledge, there was almost no cases at all actively in San Angelo. And so fast forward to our current kind of um, case rates, we have over 1,000 active cases with more than 70 hospitalizations in San Angelo. So that's pretty alarming. So we've actually made national headline news for being such a, uh, you know, a county and city with such significant cases that are increasing beyond what we even imagined a year ago. So. Although we do appreciate the, uh, the data that's being shared and uh, constantly being updated with the case rates at campuses, um, I'm fairly confident that those numbers are actually 
much lower than what true representation is because to my knowledge those cases are the ones the schools are reporting and the nurses and and so forth this doesn't account for the kids that are being kept home from you know from school because their parents are acknowledging uh, COVID related symptoms and getting them tested at external sites so um, I imagine the numbers, although again, very appreciative that are being shared, are actually much lower than what is actually taking place at our campuses. Um, very soon, you know, obviously we're looking at uh, vaccinations for our younger um, kids. I've got one child that's vaccinated and one child that's not. Um, so it's still pretty alarming, you know, not knowing if one's going to bring it and pass it to the other despite their vaccination status. Um, but. I, I also appreciate the vaccination clinics that this uh, 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 district and this board uh, members have been put together in addition to all the wonderful information that's been shared about the IVP devices. But until these are in every classroom, as mentioned, you know, per CDC guidance, I think that mass mandates, even just in um, high capacity areas, traffic in the hallways could be I, I think somewhat doable. Now, of course, we are thankful to have a lawyer on the board who's obviously looked into you know, the specifics and prefaced this meeting by kind of mentioning what can and can't be done. And I, I'm very much aware that your hands are tied. And without a virtual option, the, you know, the, the, the chance of a mask being mandated um, is very slim to none. Uh, but you know, again, when you kind of consider odds, you know, against, you know, kind of, uh, you know, discussions and what can and can't be considered, uh, considered um, it's, it's very easy to kind of revisit, you know, the last time, you know, I was in this boardroom asking you to rename a middle school and now here we are. So I, I think that there's some things that can be considered, um, again, at least in high traffic areas, uh, hallways, going to and from classrooms, uh, some type of rule or guidance that could be implemented. And um, especially with our upper grade levels, uh, middle school and high school, um, Kaylee had mentioned, you know, it's really great at hiding braces and acne, but I feel like mask wearing for some reason in middle school has kind of become something to be made fun of in uh, middle school and high school. So it's kind of fit in along the ranks of braces and glasses and acne, all of which I had in middle school. So um, it's, it's unfortunate that these kids have now kind of chosen to kind of politicize this with many of their parents um, and kind of make this a, a talking point or something to make fun of other children for when, you know, there could be, you know, doing this to save the life of their immunocompromised sibling that can't go to school because we don't have a mask, okay? So, um, again, I understand the specifics. I understand your hands are tied. It's very unlikely that any of these comments are going to persuade you, and you've obviously looked into all the logistics, but, again, reconsideration at the highest level and I would invite you despite whatever devices are being introduced that you continue to explore um, any avenues for at least again just some rules and guidance I know that it's encouraged but not required but maybe we can move to an encouraged but required in the hallways encouraged but uh, required in the the lunchroom you know bef before you're eating I think there's some things that we can do and I would uh, strongly encourage you continue to look into those thank you Thank you, Mr. Ramon. Um, and then I have one other, Ms. Le Carmen Ledesma, and I think she's going to speak about something different. Just a second, get up so we can so we can hear it on the recording. Good evening. My name is Carmen Ledesma. I have uh, grandchildren in a few different schools here. District. Um, my concern is the busing. I am so glad that everybody came here to be proactive about what is happening in the schools. But our kids are being, they're being loaded on these buses like sardines. There's no social distancing there. By the time they get to their buses and stuff, they're taking their masks off. So every proactive action that's being taken at school ah, goes out the door when they get on the bus. You know, so um, my concern, I've, I've went ahead and I've expressed my concern to the schools that, you know, this directly, you know, impacts. Um, and they suggested that I come here to the school board. Not only that, the shelters for the kids when they're waiting for their buses. You know, time change, it's dark out there when the kids are waiting for their buses. 
dark, it's cold, it's wet, and there's nothing covering these kids. The parents have to be to work at a certain time, so it sets them back having to sit in the car with their kids so they don't get heat strokes, rained on, snowed on. There's nothing out there. Has it been considered to ever put up some shelters for kids that are waiting for their buses? That also would cut down on allergies, you know, uh, a, a lot of things, cold, you know, everything else if they were protected. It's nice that we're in the schools protecting them, but from home to school, there's that middle point where they're not being protected. My, my granddaughter, 12 years old, and she does not have a physique of a 12-year-old. You know, if you didn't know she was 12 and you pushed her, you thought she was like 16 or so. It scares me that she is out there, sometimes maybe the first child out there. There is nothing but a field out there with trees. That scares me that she's out there. Would the shelter keep um, danger away? No, but it would deter it. Does it have lights, you know, or at least some sort of illuminant? But to have her out there all by herself sometimes is scary. Could we consider putting some shelters out there for the kids? With these machines coming in, I think it's great. I really do. It's a gamble. They may work, they may not work. They're new, like this gentleman said, you know, but there's nothing to lose to try them out. But once again, you know, if the, the, we get some portable ones, school's out when the kids load up on the bus. Let's figure out how we can get them on the bus and clear out that area, you know, and clear the air because the kids are not protected there. So I appreciate you giving me the time to express my concerns. Um, and might not be the most popular person walking away. But I'm really disappointed that none of you guys have masks on. When that was going to be the topic today is the COVID, what we can do to filter the air, and none of you have a mask on. We lead by example. But you don't have it on, sir. I can tell you like I tell my kids. I can take you to the doctor. We can get you medicine. But if you don't take it, it don't work. So you lead by example. The example here... Like this gentleman said, you guys will probably not take into consideration if you don't wear them yourself. But these are our babies out there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ledesma. All right. Thank you. Did you is she signed it signed in now? So what Oh she has? Let me look then. Um, is it Ms. Martinez? Martin. Mart Martin. Okay, it is right here. I just, it's, I lost it in the shuffle. Anna Martin. I'm sorry. Um, yes. I just first want to say thank you for considering these filters. Um, last year was a real trial. Um, and so I just want to preface that by saying thank you for considering that. Um, Good evening, uh, school board members, district administrators, fellow community members. My name is Anna Martine, and I student taught in the district in 2008, subbed and was a paraprofessional in 2009, taught in 2010, and again in the 2018 through 2021 school years. I have a total of 12 years served in elementary education. I'm speaking today both as a community member, teacher, and as a person with a chronic illness and asking that you mercifully mandate masks. And like someone else said, I know that you can't do it outright, but there are loopholes that can be considered. I'm just gonna speak from my experience now. Last year, as we were told to stay home and begin virtual learning for our benefit and to protect the students and faculty from this novel virus, I was so thankful to the district for looking out for my health and the wellness of my students. I enthusiastically dove into creating virtual content for my students, but I was especially grateful because you see my grandmother was suffering from Parkinson's and dementia 
and was relying on me for help at home. You made a decision that kept her from contracting this disease. Then, at the, around the time of the school district beginning, she went on hospice, and I felt both ambiguous and abandoned. I felt the plans did not involve teachers and were, in my experience, lax on the CDC recommendations. I had no social distancing capability in my room. As my roster crawled from 16 two days before school to 24 a couple of weeks into it because so many parents could not see the virtual platform as feasible and there was no choice um, enforced. If they chose it, they were allowed to come back to school at any point that they wished. My students did not ever wear masks and there was no additional help in cleaning and disinfecting. I know you said um, there is disinfecting as needed, um, but in a kindergarten classroom um, with one custodian at the beginning of the school year, a majority of the cleaning and disinfecting was left up to me, and the supplies were brought by parents. Um, as you can imagine, with a person on hospice at home, you would want to be very careful, but I felt as though I was taking my life into my hands every day. Stress and anxiety became a constant companion. Today I stand as a teacher on hiatus until districts begin to place the teachers and students first, not just in lip service, but in practice. And by this I mean consider the human condition of each person on a campus and who they may endanger by exposing them to the virus. Can a mask 100% shield you from the illness? No. But the combined effort of all in a classroom and district working together can bring the incidences down and can decrease spreading. And masks, along with other measures like the IVP, can help us combat the rising numbers. Teachers have always known that kids will make you sick. We accepted colds, flus, stomach bugs, etc. But we expect safety measures to be in place when there is danger. We expect kids to have their required vaccines and for there to be a heart defibrillator on campus. Masks are a small measure to give many people a peace of mind. They do not harm you, which is scientifically, scientifically proven. And if they take even an ounce of anxiety away from already overworked teachers and parents, I believe they are worth it. Please consider mandating masks, by figuring out a way to, to work them into the school dress codes or like Mr. Ramon suggested, mandating it for just high traffic areas because I think it's good for all the faculty, staff, and the students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. All right, is there anyone else? Ms. Lucas, okay. Be sure you, uh, we have her information. Okay, fine, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for all you do, all at the schools and that all that you've done through COVID. And um, I just want to say that I would err on the side of freedom. And I didn't hear anybody talking about um, the legal side of it is our AG, Ken Paxton, and our governor says that masks cannot be mandated in our state. And I want to say that erring on the side of, of giving the students and the teachers and everybody a choice of whether to have a mask or not to have a mask because it feels like you're taking away freedom from one group and the other group can push their agenda on everyone. And so we can start saying everybody has to wear burkas or something. But what we want is freedom to, to choose and have respect for the ones that want to wear a mask and the ones that don't want to wear a mask. I had COVID. My family had COVID about seven months ago. We got over it. We are okay. And if with the right treatments, which we should be encouraging in our city, 
that we have, it, they have talked about how strong immune system, your immune system is, and that they're realizing now that people have strong immunity after having COVID. And, um, and my daughter-in-law just died two weeks ago from getting the vaccine. So I do not think we should mandate vaccines either. So I think that it is, we are in a free country under a constitution where we can make personal choices for our own health. And it's not the government's right to mandate how we take care of our own bodies. And they would say that as a woman's choice to kill a baby, but, but they don't want to say that it's okay for us to take care of our own bodies when it comes to our own health. So I just want you um, to encourage you. Thank you for for keeping us free to be able to choose. And I think most people are very, very respectful when it comes to the distancing, when it comes to trying to be more careful about not getting anyone sick. And it's kind of brought it to the surface. And I don't think anyone has been hateful about it at all. I think it is a free country. We need to keep it that way. So thank you all for let me talk. Thank you, Ms. Lucas. And have a good evening. Right. Is, is that everybody, Molly? All right. Okay. Well, thank you. And now we'll move on with uh, our agenda. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know, some of these were on pre-agenda, and we may have already answered, but I'll go through these. Is there any... Uh, on our student enrollment report, there's... You bet, there's, I'll tell you about that the, for the September report that you have for the September 7th, 3rd, Tuesday of the school year. Uh, we have 13,803 total students according to that report on September 7th, uh, which is down from this time or that time, I should say, last year by about 153 student count. As I'm looking at it, so that was September 7th. I've seen the most recent one as of today, and, and we're growing in student number, but it's keeping about that 150 difference. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody have questions for Mr. McFarland? Okay. Uh, Dr. Ritter, update, anything on updated academic programs? Thank you and good evening, Mr. Parker, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board. Um, it's our pleasure this evening to um, discuss with you how we are addressing the learning gap. And I have with me Mrs. Ricky Black, who is our director for elementary curriculum and instruction in the district. And together we have put together just a, a brief presentation to bring you up to date with some of the techniques and methods we're using to address um, things that we're seeing in our schools now that we are back and we have um, many of many of our students who who do have um, we're seeing some struggles that we know that we haven't seen before in the classroom um, but we wanted to to just let you and the public know about the work that our team is doing and our teachers our administrators and with your support how we are addressing those learning gaps um, I will let's see All right, and so in addressing um, the learning gap, you know, we want to establish the why behind this. And I'll, I'll say that we are seeing an unprecedented number of children in our schools who um, never before have we seen the cases of, of children who haven't even been in school, many of them for um, coming up on two years. We have second graders in our schools right now who haven't even been in kindergarten. They didn't attend kindergarten, first grade, and now they're in second grade. We're doing these assessments with them, and we have students sitting in second grade who many of them can't even recognize letters. They haven't been exposed to print and to text and to words. They, they don't understand that letters go together to make words. Um, and this is across the district, um, not really high numbers, but enough that it's very concerning and we see that. It's not just with our younger students, but across all levels of our district, what we're finding through our early assessments at beginning of year are that these learning gaps are very, they're obvious that in our students are 
Um, say like in math, for instance, our Algebra 1 students, many of our kiddos are coming in and there are foundational math gaps, gaps in math skills, and our teachers are seeing through our assessments that we're carrying out that, um, that these targeted skills are things that are really going to need to be addressed so that our students can continue to progress. Um, and this continues all the way through. We're even hearing from colleagues at the university level that they're seeing the same thing. They're saying it's, my goodness, unprecedented. The levels of, of students who maybe have been in college a couple of years and then now are in those higher classes that even students in colleges, because of the um, break in the, the educational, um, the programming or the platforms and in-person learning, that many of the students are experiencing some gaps in learning. They're seeing gaps in this um, pre prerequisite skills that you would expect to see at all levels. So as we're, we talk about that vertical experience of the student, and so this evening we just wanted to, to highlight some of the things we're doing and, and really to, um, to, to say how much we appreciate our teachers' efforts and the efforts on the campuses for addressing these things that we're seeing in classes. So we know that our diagnostic screening will help us to pinpoint these gaps that we're seeing and, um, and understand more about what's, what's behind these, um, these skill deficits. And so we're using screeners and diagnostic um, assessments to work with each student on an individual basis across the district at all levels so that we can determine where the areas are that they need them. And so Ricky's going to talk about a few of these assessments and the programs that go with them. Um, starting off with Amplify Reading um, is new this year for our district. Um, it is TEA approved. Um, it is for grades K through five. And so it's a responsive intervention um, after we do the screener. Um, it's based on the science of reading, and as you know, a lot of our teachers and our assistant principals, principals and instructional coaches are going through reading academies and really learning about the science of reading, and this program is very much based on that. Um, it's age-appropriate narratives that create a learning experience that leaps off the screen. So you're going to see it's, it's game-like, it has characters, and it really hones in to the uh, young kids and brings some excitement to reading. It, um, it adapts to each student's unique needs across 13 skills areas based on a diagnostic assessment, which is through that screener. So we're going from um, phonemic awareness, hearing those sounds, to uh, naming the letter that makes that sound. What sound does that letter make? Um, all the way to vocabulary and reading and fluency. So it goes across 13 skills. Um, it's built-in scaffolding, so it starts with the lowest level, that phonemic awareness, hearing those sounds, all the way down to closed reading, where they're reading fluently. And so um, it really pinpoints from that screener. So this is the first screener that I was talking about, and it's K through two. So it's our kinder through second grade, and it's the ELAR, it's the reading portion. It is teacher-led, so we're going back to, before we had a computer, you stick a kid on a computer, and they go through and it would place a child. This is more, we're going back to the one-on-one, -on -one. so the teacher is sitting with that student individually and is assessing them with some subtest. Um, it's focused directly on specific skills that the student needs to learn, like fluency, reading comprehension, uh, vocabulary, phonics, phonemic awareness that we talked about before. And what they do then is they're gonna be addressing those every two weeks and to see where um, they are progressing. And then we're really excited because as reading is mandated by the state, 
Math is not, so the math screener is new. We've never had a math screener before, but we know with kids being out that there is um, some gaps and we want to be able to pinpoint those gaps with math also. So it's going to uncover some of those um, mathematical reasoning and those foundational skills that kids mi have missed uh, from K to two especially. And those are gonna be like number sense, computation, it's um, that quick retrieval, like how fast do they, they know their facts, um, what, are missing, what is the missing number, and so they will work and pinpoint those skills where they have any deficiencies. So it's, it's also research-based, and um, that screener will then take you to, um, it will show the teacher how to group your kids um, all of these kids need number sense, for example, and then it will lend them to lessons already made that will pinpoint those deficits and help them grow in each of those areas. And then for our third grade up to high school, we've added high school this year. Um, what we've used in the past, and that's NWEA MAP. So that's the math growth, MAP growth, sorry, um, in literacy, math, and science. It is computer-based as far as they get on, and um, they go through this assessment. And as the kids go along, when they, if they keep progressing, it keeps going and keeps going until they top out of where their level is. And so um, if they start going and they run into some troubles, it backs it down a little bit, so it really gets to where the student is. And so that tells the teacher where they're ready to learn. And it will also group kids, give lessons for students, and so that it's um, a lot more pin, uh, pinpointed and targeted for the teachers to be able to uh, uh, bring those small groups and help them um, grow. You're familiar with our scholastic coaching and we are continuing that. This year we're excited that our scholastic coaches are back on campuses and working directly with teachers along with our instructional coaches and um, our on-site consultants are coaching those IC instructional coaches to work with teachers in the classroom through their professional learning communities and professional learning. They're also directly assisting teachers with their scholastic libraries, intentional planning, guided reading components, and the components of our literacy resources that we have continued to keep, um, we just continue to build those on every campus. And we have also grown our middle school literacy program and the support through the social studies content. We're also training and helping our social studies teachers with literacy so that they are learning more about literacy and how it goes together with their content as well. And we are also continuing our math solutions coaching. And again, um, the focus with instructional coaches, but also with teachers directly in the classroom in bringing them together and helping them learn more about effective instructional strategies for math. And it ties in directly with the assessment that we're doing, that they are able to help pinpoint the skills and help our teachers know exactly the kinds of universal and also tiered instructional strategies to use with students to help target that and increase that growth that will hopefully we'll be able to see with that MAP assessment, the um, measure of academic progress, when we are able to see that growth when we have that middle of year assessment. We've spoken before about our Apple iPad initiative. Our high school students all have the Apple iPads in their hands now, and the teachers as well. And they have really taken off and are learning so much about what they can do in the classroom every single day and use that as not just a tool for like a digital worksheet, but what are they doing to synthesize information and use our learner profile attributes 
to utilize this tool to help them to grow in their skills as a student who can go in and seek information, find information, and then synthesize that information to create something original and to also help them with products that are very original and creative. And it's been really exciting to see this happening. Um, we're working with getting, so the middle school teachers have their iPads as well. And we have our, our digital innovation facilitators who are Brandon Feck, oh, excuse me, Brandon Lagan and Jennifer Feck, who are going to campuses and helping to teach our teachers in between times that our Apple coaches are coming to San Angelo to help us with that as well. And then lastly, um, one of the things, we hear all of these great <coughs> things that are going on in our schools, and we're doing so much to provide resources and foundational curriculum and frameworks for our teachers, but it's only so good as how it's implemented. And we're helping our principals, our instructional coaches, our campus administrators, to really help them with implementation and what are the things that they need to be looking for in the classroom. Our principals are receiving executive coaching from um, a group that's coming in to do professional coaching with them. And that is going to be so helpful as they help them with their goal setting. It aligns with their principal appraisals. The state of Texas changed principal appraisals this year for their TPES to align with the levers of effective school leadership, which focuses on instructional leadership directly in the classroom. So it's helping our principals set goals. What are the things they need to be looking for in the classroom? How often are they getting into the classroom to observe instruction? And then what kinds of feedback are they providing our teachers to really improve the practice and to make sure that the things that we're investing in, both time and resources, that those things are actually being utilized with fidelity in the classroom and that we're seeing the outcomes that we hope to see from those. So that is really just an update on the things we're doing. Are there any questions from the board at this time? So Jana, obviously we're doing all these things that, so we can have data-driven instruction in the classrooms. With our one-to-one -one initiative, would it also allow, is there an easy way for parents to access where their student is so that when they are at home using the same iPad that they're using on campus, they're making sure that they're on the right level for reading and math, et cetera, other than just homework, but you know, when they're encouraging their child to do above and beyond things so that they're doing it on the right level. I'll say that with, so our iPads are at high school only for now, but with our, like our elementary students, for example, there is, a strong focus with those classroom teachers who are helping parents as partners. They're going to know the levels of their students, what their levels are, what they are working on, what they need to be doing, and where their, their goals are for growth. The same thing with middle school students. They'll be working with them closely. High school students, we hope so, yes, but high school students are, as, as they, of course, matriculate and they're older through the, the levels, they're a lot more independent. But there are definitely ways that teachers are going to reach out and work with parents because we know that with this, um, the learning gaps that we've seen, we have to get our students back on level. We have to. And so whatever it takes for us to have that communication with parents and really partner with them at all levels is what is going to happen for them. Absolutely. And on the M class, they have a parent home connection. And it actually, before, it would, it's, you'd always have a site work on these items, but a lot of times some of our parents may not know how to teach that. It actually gives videos and how-tos and gives them lessons like you need these kind of materials, do this project at home that will enforce what we're doing on campus. One thing I'll add is with House Bill 4545, it is a requirement that all students who are unsuccessful on the STAR test in any area content, um, that we are providing 30 hours of additional um, intervention and instruction to them through the school year. We are addressing that after we finish these assessments at the beginning of year. We're developing those individual instruction and acceleration plans for every student that was not successful, but then also the ones that maybe they were successful on STAR, but our assessment is telling us that we need to be paying closer attention and that there are some skills that are still 
lacking and we will have those plans that we will be working through with them as well and that's at all levels elementary middle school and high school try this mic <laughs> so um I think, it's, so first of all, I loved hearing about all the different programs. I've heard some, but thank you for all the details. But um, my concern is about the second graders that you mentioned at the beginning. Yes. And I was wondering if M class and Amplify Reading, I'm assuming it starts them at the beginning. So I was wondering how fast we can expect them to propel and get back up to where they are, where they need to be grade level wise. You know, um, it's, it's going to take individual instruction it's really nothing that just a program is going to do. It's going to take um, individual instruction, one-on-one -on -one instruction. So the interventionists that we did hire for every elementary school this year, they're busy, busy, busy. They are working with those students and they may be having to drop them down obviously to a very much lower level of like emergent reader level skills to work on with them and starting from the very basic. but they're going to make growth. What we see with those younger students, they do make um, faster growth. And so we anticipate that will happen, but it is going to take time. And, and, it's, and it's concerning, absolutely, because we just haven't seen the numbers that we're seeing with learning gaps like we see. And so we have to find ways to address that and find ways um, during the school day uh, when it's most effective to work with them and pull those students and find time to, to work with them. And also, after school, before school, we're doing everything we can to pull them in for additional tutoring sessions and utilizing, um, utilizing even individuals, maybe retired teachers who are coming into our schools and helping us with these students. It's just going to take an individual learning plan based on this great assessment um, and also the programs, but it, it, it will be that individualized instruction that has to occur. Dr. Ritter, do we have sufficient instructional specialists and or tutors? And if not, are they even available at this point? We do. Um, at this time, we do have interventionists that are at every elementary school. And so that's, that's great, and we're, we're thrilled with that. We know that, and these are all interventionists that Ricky and her team in elementary interviewed each one of them. So these are master teachers that are very skilled at helping. And it's not just reading, it's reading and math because we know that math, um, sure. it may be not as apparent as it is when a student can't read, but we're seeing the gaps there as well. So these people are skilled and trained and to um, work with the students individually for reading and math deficits as well. Right, that, that math deficit oh, may not be as evident in second grade as it turns up to be in fourth grade all of a sudden. That's right. Um, we're also, we do work with them once a month. We pull those interventionists and continue professional learning and training and then also just help to calibrate the skills that we are focusing on with them because they're coming and bringing data from their stu about their students so that we can talk about it and talk about what we can do to address the needs of these kids and, and let them hear from each other as well about what's working, what maybe isn't working so well, and then get ideas from each other and, and collaborate around how to increase the effectiveness. Right. Well, as Dr. McFarland mentioned earlier, you know, there are some ESSER funds out there that if we need to it somehow uh, bring those learning gaps under control as best we can. And Absolutely. If it takes Yes. people, then we need to find those yes. people to make that happen. Yes, and the ESSER funds are definitely assisting with all of these things that we highlighted today. Sure. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you. The, the child or, or children that you're seeing in first or second grade that don't know their letters anything, or is this the first time they've been in school? Or they, yes. they haven't been in other schools and transferred in, and they haven't been in our schools? They're just coming in for the first time. That's what we're finding, and as we're finishing um, this assessment window or the period of time that we do this beginning of your assessment, that's what what we're seeing. And so we we just are we're getting the stories. You know, every week we hear about more and some students that are surfacing through. We do have some who've moved in, but some of these students are um, are just children who just have not accessed school. And are they? Um do they is English their first language? Yes, some are not, but some are. We have it's a mix, definitely. And, and I know right 
is there some way, uh, I think I'll ask this for Dr. Detloff for us just to be thinking about it. Is there, is there any plan or anything that we can utilize to try to, um, I guess, get word to those parents of younger children about you've got, we have to get your kids in pre-K or our kindergarten programs and because uh, I assume it's um, part of this just has to be ignorance by some people I'm saying bringing them in in first or second grade that unless it's just totally intentional thinking I don't need to bring my child in till second grade but how do we reach those parents to get the, the word out that this has to ha occur sooner so One of the things that we're doing, and this is also with um, Whitney and Molly and our communications team, and the pop-up events that you hear about, our literacy pop-up events, we've done lots of pop-up events across our neighborhoods throughout the summer um, to highlight San Angelo Reads, but also to use those events to attract people to the understanding of the importance of early literacy and getting their students in school. But we also are seeing that even with pre-K numbers, we have some sites that we have um, waiting lists, and when we reach out to ask them to go to a site that has room, they're just not necessarily um, that understanding of the needs. So they're doing home visits. They're going out in the communities and the neighborhoods to try to help um, educate parents and also to deliver books in the hands of students who so are still through San Angelo Reads and um, those amazing donations that we've gotten from businesses and individuals in our community to help with even the, the books that are delivered during pop-up events or when we go to the homes for San Angelo Reads. Um, those are things all that help to get books into the homes. Because I think that that's probably one of the most eye-opening things is that we realize that we have an eight-year-old sitting in front of us who hasn't seen print, who has not doesn't even understand what letters are. So. It's, very, it's been very eye-opening for us, but it, all of us are um, out there trying to help and determine next steps and what we need to do to help. And Mr. Parker, I think you know, the terminology we use now also, learning gap, I think describes that. You know, in, in the past, that may be talking about discussing a learning loss, but with a learning gap, they, they have never accessed schooling at all. And so what we're seeing is the families are nervous uh, about the health of their their children and so they're just making a many are making a choice uh, to keep their students at home and typically that's happened at the uh, pre-k kindergarten and first grade level so um, I think we've kind of shifted that terminology to learning gap uh, because they these uh, individuals simply haven't accessed school I think I do want to uh, make a comment and show my appreciation to Ms. Black and our curriculum instruction team and uh, Dr. Ritter what what we've heard tonight is that that tiered system of support so first with these new screeners so they looked at the evidence before them with the you know the the learning uh, loss and with these screeners we're screening all K through two students in math and reading so that's differentiating into small groups and then the overlay is the coaching, the executive coaching that you're seeing to show, okay, now let's use the research-based practices and let's, just like we use the uh, science behind virus mitigation, let's use the science behind teaching reading and math. So that overlay now, now we have the groups from the assessments and the new screeners. So now let's overlay the best practices, the research-based practices, and we're teaching our, uh, our uh, educators and principals uh, of the best way to do that. So we are hopeful that that uh, tiered approach and multi-systems of, of support will uh, certainly enhance and, and help us to close that gap because uh, that is new for us that we are seeing uh, this last 18 months, many families choosing um, not to go to school because they're uh, concerned about the health um, of their uh, students. And then, of course, if you couple that with a, a virtual platform versus in-person learning, uh, we have some of that, too. So I appreciate the, the efforts that are being made to, uh, to do what we can. And we're going to keep working uh, diligently until we can, uh, um, you know, ensure all, all our students have that, that school readiness to begin uh, and launch their literacy and, and uh, numeracy uh, careers. One thing that we wanted to highlight is we really wanted to highlight our um, Spanish-speaking families and our numbers of our bilingual classes. 
and it has increased. And so that's exciting and encouraging. And when you go into those classrooms, it's really exciting learning to see that. So um, that is an, an encouraging area where we're seeing great success and lots of growth with our students who are in our Spanish pre-K and kindergartens this year. So our last question, Dr. Reeder, are we seeing uh, a significant amount of, of influx of uh, migrant students in our district that you can tell? Oh gosh, where we've seen really the greatest increase um, from previous years is in the higher levels, even high school. Lakeview mm -hmm. High School, um, I don't know the exact number, and that might be a future academic report because it's very interesting. We have a large number of migrant students from um, other countries, not um, even not Mexico, and so they. That's been that's been. So um, they're technically they're coming unaccompanied from families, just unaccompanied. Wow. Migrants, okay. yes, youth, and coming in, being placed by different entities into homes where they've located family members, maybe. Um, and okay, so they are them. finding finding homes and not. Just yes, showing up. finding okay. homes, but they're considered, um, you know, unaccompanied youth okay, to come thanks. into the country, and they're coming here. So yes, okay. so lots in our, um, or more than we've ever seen before in the older grade levels. Okay, thanks. Thanks yes. for that, that uh, update. All right. Any other questions, Dr. Ritter, Ms. Black? We appreciate you. Uh, um, Thank you for waiting patiently to be able to give your report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for All right. I, I keep putting this off thinking that we're going to get out of this, but I didn't ever ask anybody if they need to take a break for a bathroom break. <laughs> Usually I'm the first one to have to do that, you know. But uh, Is there some more public comment, Dr. Kingman? <laughs> we have... Uh, if, if some were nodding their head, why don't we take a five-minute break? We'll, we, I think we're going to be through here pretty quickly. We've got our consent items, and we'll, we'll be out of here in a few minutes. But uh, let's take a five-minute break. All right, we're going to go back on the record. Um, I'm... Um, We now have our uh, consent items. We have consent items A through F. Uh, consent item A is consider donations. Consent item B is consider approval of the quarterly investment report ending August 31 through 2021. C, consider extracurricular status at the 4-H organization adjunct faculty agreement of Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, Tom Green County. D, uh, which we don't have anything um, to uh, to consider on this was consider superintendent's recommendation for personnel. As I understand it, we didn't add anybody for that. Uh, e, consider bid number 21-018, first aid, nursing, and athletic trainer supplies. And F, consider local board policy updates, district of innovation. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve? Move for consent items A through F for approval. Second. We have a Motion by Mr. Daniel, second by Dr. Kingman to ap approve our consent items A through F, understanding that there isn't uh, any uh, recommendations uh, that are included in D. Is there any other board discussion uh, about these items? Is there any public comment? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. Um, Agenda item D, consider bills, accounts, and financial statements for August 2021, as we discussed in our pre-agenda meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve bills, accounts, and financial statements from August of 2021. And just as a reminder, all our checkbook is on the uh, district website under financial transparency. Um, and you can see our entire check register as well as all of our reports on monthly and quarterly investments. Second. Right, we have a, a motion to approve by Dr. Kingman and a second by Mr. Dindle. Um, is there any other board discussion? Is there any public comment on this agenda item? 
If not, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Motion passes. Dr. Gomez, uh, consider class size waivers for 2021 half in 2022. Mr. Parker, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board, um, as you received in your board packet, pursuant to Texas Education Code 25.112, each district in Texas is required to conduct a class size enrollment survey for kindergarten through fourth grade. As you know, we're constantly monitoring enrollment and things can change, even from when we submitted this in your board packet um, on Friday to today. So I wanna provide some further clarity on what uh, we originally submitted to you. If a classroom exceeds a 22 to one student to teacher ratio, the district must submit a waiver request to the Texas Education Agency after receiving approval from the local board of trustees. We conduct these weekly class surveys every Monday and have been monitoring classes from the beginning of the school year. So as of Friday, out of our 17 elementary campuses with 265 K through fourth grade classrooms, we had four campuses with a total of eight classrooms exceeding the 22 to one student to teacher ratio. As of today with our enrollment count, we've added an additional campus with one additional classroom. So we will be submitting that waiver to TA with your approval. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. We discuss some of this at our pre-agenda meeting. Is there any other um, board questions for Dr. Gomez on this issue? Dr. Gomez, so just to reiterate, is, this is for nine out of 265 classrooms? Correct. Okay. And then do we need, for our motion, do we need to amend since this says eight? Okay. Yes. Not, uh, nine. Okay. Yes. I'll make the motion that we um, approve administrative recommendations for the approval of class size waivers um, with the amendment for nine classrooms exceeding the 22 to one student ratio um, as outlined otherwise above. Second. We have a motion by Dr. King and a second by Mr. Gallegos to, uh, as discussed, consider class size waivers for 2021-2022. Uh, five campuses, nine classrooms. Uh, is there any other board discussion on this agenda item? Is there any public comment? If not, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Motion passes. Uh, I'll go through announcements and then we're going to go very briefly into the executive session. Uh, we have our TASB, uh, TASA TASB convention in Dallas. This, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, September 24th through and September 25th, 2021. October 12th, we have our finance pre-agenda workshop. That'll be on a Tuesday. And then October 18th, we have our regular board meeting. Um, with that said, we're now gonna go into executive session under the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, 551.071 consultation with attorneys and 551.074 personnel matters. We're in, we're in, uh, we're what? Closed session. Well, <laughs> yes. Closed session. I'm going the word I'm looking for. <laughs> All right, we're back from executive session. Uh, we've got our board team back. Uh, we took no votes. We took no action. Unless any board member has anything else that needs to be announced, the uh, meeting will now be adjourned. Thank you for being here.